This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by M.M. Lafleur. Want to look impeccable at the office but have better things to do than shop for workwear? M.M. Lafleur is a women's workwear brand that offers luxurious, pragmatic clothing and personal styling to today's busy professional woman. Just fill out a quick online survey and one of their discerning stylists will send you a bento box of wardrobe staples, handpicked just for you in plus sizes or straight sizes. Try everything on at home, keep what you like, and send the rest back. It's completely free to try and because they're not a subscription service, there's no commitment. To try a bento yourself, visit mmbento.com. That's M-M-B-E-N-T-O dot com. And use the code PSYCH at checkout and M.M. Lafleur will donate 10% of profits to global giving. That's PSYCH, P-S-Y-C-H, at checkout. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, and body liberation. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor, offering online courses and programs to help people all over the world make peace with food. Join me here every week as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. Uh-huh. I, I, I remember I was teething, little gums bleeding, Friday evening, it was all about eating. When I became a teen, it was all about beef, and now I'm ready for the world. Try and sink my teeth in, stacking it. Hey there, welcome to episode 133 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Kai Hibbard, a former Biggest Loser contestant and current anti-diet activist. We talked about the negative effects of weight bias and stigma on larger-bodied people, Kai's journey from disordered eater to health at every size and anti-diet activist, the social determinants of health and how they affect people's well-being, and so much more, so I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. But first, I'll answer this week's listener question, which is from a listener named Emily who writes, Hi, Christy. I love your show and appreciate the work you do. Here's my question. There is a way I eat for ethical reasons and pleasure. It also makes my body feel best. However, some of these choices and my interest in them often keeps me in a community that uses labels and overlaps with diet culture. I'm beginning to see that I have been falling into dieting mentality more recently, and I'm wondering if it's due to those factors and some of those food beliefs I've developed. It's difficult because they are important to me, but it's also important to me that I'm mentally well and trying to pursue life as a normal eater, which I know can include making ethical choices. I'm having a hard time knowing how to be flexible with myself and knowing when this community and style of eating is bringing up diet mentality thoughts and behaviors. Do you have any wisdom on how to navigate this or some practical ways to check in with myself about potential triggers and choices? So thanks, Emily, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So yeah, I can totally understand why being a part of that kind of community would trigger the diet mentality in you. It does this for a lot of people, so you're not alone. And I definitely have some ideas about how to navigate it. So the first thing I really recommend for people in this position is that you have to put on your oxygen mask first before helping others. You know, as an adult, you are your own primary caretaker, right? Like there's no one there to parent you. You're your own parent and you really owe it to yourself to take care of your own needs, right? To the best of your ability and to ask for help and accept help when you have needs that you're not able to meet, right? So until you can really do that, you're not actually in a position to help others or make choices that are fully ethical because ignoring your own needs and putting others first isn't really ethical. It's martyrdom, right? There are certain very specific circumstances, of course, when sacrificing yourself for others or putting others first is the right thing to do, but those circumstances are not everyday life. So in everyday life, you are are your own responsibility. You are your own parent. You are taking care of yourself, right? And taking care of your own needs. And your needs include access to food that feels safe and secure and the ability to trust your body and trust your relationship with food. And you make food decisions so many times a day because every time you're eating, you're making a choice about food, you're thinking about it, you're having to plan for it. So we all have to think about food in a normal relationship with food multiple times a day and make choices multiple times a day. And if you're making a self-sacrificing choice each of those times that is not in line with good self-care and taking care of yourself to the best of your abilities, both your mental and your physical health, and also your overall well-being and your pleasure, you're not actually acting, I would argue, in an ethical manner because you're putting yourself last and you're treating yourself 
badly, right? You're not being a good parent to yourself. So if you think about a parent taking good care of a child, right, they're responding to that child's needs. You know, if that child is crying or upset, the parent asks them what's wrong. Or if it's a baby and they can't say what's wrong, the parent tries a bunch of different things to get the baby to stop crying, right? And the baby will eventually let you know what works, you know, and you might be like, okay, I tried a pacifier, I tried feeding them, I tried rocking them, none of that's helping. Let me try changing the diaper up. Oh, there it is, you know, got it, right? So you might have to try sort of trial and error to take care of yourself as an adult, right? And, and especially with food choices, it's like, okay, what am I in the mood for? Do I want a snack? Do I want a meal? Do I want something savory, something sweet? You might have to ask yourself a bunch of different questions and sort of zero in on it before you can be like, aha, this is what I need. You know, I'm meeting my needs now. But all of that is to say, as adults, it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves and to parent ourselves. And if we are not doing that, if we're not putting our oxygen mask on first with our relationship with food, then we're not actually in a position to make ethical choices, really. So I would say that it's really important to heal your relationship with food first. And research actually shows that people who are on a vegetarian or vegan diet, for example, I don't know, you didn't say what the ethical choice was that you were making, but just for example, because I have a feeling it might be something like that. But research has been done on this area of people who are on a vegetarian or vegan diet and trying to recover from an eating disorder. And the research has found that people who are doing that, who have those dietary restrictions, actually had lower rates of recovery and higher rates of relapse from eating disorders. So all that is to say, like, give yourself the best possible chance of recovery by waiting until you've healed your relationship with food before embarking on a dietary regime like that or whatever, whatever restriction you're doing, whatever ethical choice you're making. It is a restriction, right? Your body is perceiving it. Your mind is perceiving it as a restriction. And if you're in the place where you haven't yet healed from restrictive eating behaviors from dieting and diet culture or from food insecurity, for example, or an eating disorder, you're not necessarily in the place where ethical food restriction, food restriction by choice, is going to feel any different than these traumatic restrictions that you've been through of dieting, disordered eating, food insecurity, et cetera, right? So give yourself the chance to heal from those restrictions first. Give yourself the best possible chance of recovery by waiting until you've really healed your relationship with food before making those ethical choices because the research really bears that out. You know, the people who don't make that choice early in recovery seem to have better rates of recovery. And that research was done in people who had full-blown eating disorders, but it, I would say, probably bears in people who have gone through disordered eating and dieting and subclinical eating disorders just as well. Because from everyone I've worked with in my clinical experience, I can say that having a restrictive background, having, and this includes people who consider themselves bingers, right, who think my problem is overeating not restricting. Actually, your problem is restricting also, <laughs> generally speaking. So for everyone who has some kind of disordered eating, restriction plays a role because restriction plays a huge role in diet culture and in the formation of disordered eating. So until you can really heal from those restrictions and process that trauma, which really your body and your brain really do experience as a trauma of being restricted of adequate food, you're not going to perceive other types of food restrictions any differently or it's going to be very hard to perceive food restrictions any differently. It's going to be very triggering of this old trauma. So especially if it's a more recent choice to pursue a certain way of eating for ethical reasons, like it sounds like it is from your question, I would say this is not a longstanding identity, right? This is not something that's been a part of your life for a long time, you know? And if it's kicking up more diet mentality thoughts and making it harder to heal your relationship with food, which it sounds like it is, then it really would be best, you know, in your best interest of your recovery to just push pause on that way of eating until you've really healed your relationship with food. And that doesn't mean you have to walk away from it forever, right? If you push pause on this style of eating, you can always come back to it. So that's not to say that you have to go away from it forever. It's just to say, put it on the back burner for now, heal your relationship with food, and then re-examine that and see if that's still something that feels like an ethical decision to you based on being recovered from your food issues and really being at peace with food. And, you know, if you can re-examine it in that light and it still seems like, yeah, this isn't 
line with my values, this is what I want to do, then go for it. And it can definitely be part of a normal, intuitive, balanced, whatever you want to call it, relationship with food. So there are definitely people who are able to make that work, who are able to be intuitive eaters and also have food choices that they make for ethical reasons and they balance it out well. Because it doesn't feel like restriction, it doesn't evoke that sense of deprivation that diets and disordered eating caused because people have made peace with those things, right? Made peace with their body, made peace with food, and are able to sort of approach the dietary ethical choice from the lens of self-care and not from the lens of deprivation and restriction. So with this idea of pushing pause on that ethical food decision, there are sometimes exceptions, right? So there are some people, for example, who have religious dietary restrictions that they needed to adhere to, people that I've worked with in my practice, for example, or people who are just not willing to wait on the food choices that felt like an ethical decision because it was a central part of who they were. It was an ethical decision that they were trying to practice in all aspects of their life that was a longstanding identity, a longstanding tradition predating dieting and disordered eating. And so for those folks, you know, it's a much bigger part of their identity. It's a much more important piece to hold on to. And so in those cases, I've recommended that people at least step away from the communities around those particular types of eating for a time, right? So that might mean if it's the online communities, like unfollowing, unsubscribing, taking yourself out of the Facebook groups for those communities and just getting away from that world, getting away from the world that is oftentimes, you know, especially with like vegetarianism, veganism, it can be very wrapped up in diet culture because diet culture has its hooks and its tentacles in everything related to food and health. And especially with things that started out of like, a health food sort of movement, right? This eco-consciousness and animal rights world that led to those movements, which, you know, has a lot of great value, of course, but also gave rise to like the health food movement that sort of spawned and gave rise to clean eating, which is like the modern version, the modern sort of iteration of a certain health food focus from like the 70s or whatever, 60s and 70s, that has a lot of diet culture vestiges in it too, right? So all that is to say that like mainstream West Western dietary choices that people are making for ethical reasons definitely have value, but they also have a lot of diet culture mixed in. So it's very normal and very natural that you're picking up on diet culture inherent in these communities that you've been a part of. And I think in terms of healing your relationship with food, like pushing pause on all of it, and then especially taking yourself out of the online communities around the style of eating would be extremely helpful for your healing and your recovery from disordered eating. And if it's an in-person community, like say, for example, people who have religious dietary restrictions and they're in a religious community where everyone around them is practicing those restrictions, right? Like keeping kosher, for example, or something like you may not be able to take yourself away from that community completely. You may need to still be a part of that community for many reasons, but you can still set boundaries, right? And you can still request that people not talk about certain things with you. And depending on how close you are with a particular person, you can explain why it affects you so much. You can explain what diet culture is. You can explain why some of the ways that the dietary choice or ethical choice is showing up is harking back to diet culture or triggering you and triggering disordered eating thoughts in you. Or you can just request that they not talk about that stuff with you and not have to explain anything or just change the subject or leave the room when this stuff comes up, right? There's a lot of different ways to set boundaries depending on how comfortable and safe you are with the people that you're talking to. And sometimes setting a boundary means removing yourself from a particular situation until the topic has passed or taking action yourself and steering the conversation in a totally different direction, like an abrupt change of subject, which I think has its place and is very useful sometimes. One of the participants in the Facebook group for my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course just had this brilliant suggestion where she said, you know, have a list of complimentary or kind things that you could say about a person at the ready in your mind, like have this list going of things that you could just steer the conversation conversation totally in a different direction, but it's like a nice thing that you could say about the person or question you could ask them about themselves or something you could connect over, right? So have it be a change of subject that's fun and positive and that people want to talk about and engage with rather than a change of subject that's just like calling them out or making them feel bad or something. So, you know, you can have it be a positive thing. You can have it be an excuse to talk about things that make the other person feel good. 
So those are some strategies for dealing with this stuff, dealing with the triggers in your communities. And the biggest thing I would say is that if this is not a longstanding identity for you, if this is not something where you have all your friends and family are part of a religious community that follows certain dietary practices, or you've been an animal rights activist since you were five years old and this dietary choice was born out of that or whatever, it's totally worth it and totally makes sense to just move away from it for the time being, just push pause and come back to it when you're feeling more grounded and more rooted in your relationship with food and more able to approach it from a place of self-care, not self-control, right? Abundance, not diet mentality, all of that good stuff. So I hope that helps. And if you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. Then if you want a whole library of answers from me to help you make peace with food and become an intuitive eater, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals, so that you can leave diet culture behind once and for all. Learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode is brought to you by Jules Sous Vide by Chef Steps. Are you looking for a foolproof way to cook perfect meats, poultry, and fish? With Jules Sous Vide, every home cook can create chef-level dishes thanks to precise temperature control. Jewel makes sure your food will never over or undercook, so you're free to focus on other things, like whipping up some amazing sides and taking pleasure in the experience of cooking and eating. There are more than 100 recipes in the Video Rich Jewel app to help you cook almost every protein, from meat to fish to poultry to eggs, plus desserts, veggies, and more, so even vegetarian stuff. And if you end up getting caught up in conversation with your dinner guests or listening to a podcast while you're cooking and you lose track of time like I often do, it's not a problem. Jewel is ready when you are, so your food won't overcook. Jewel, perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash jewel and use the code foodpsych to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E and use the code foodpsych, F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H, all one word, at checkout. We're also brought to you today by M.M. LaFleur. For the woman who wants to look impeccable at work but has better things to do than sift through uninspiring racks of pantsuits, the solution is M.M. LaFleur. They take the work out of dressing for work by offering luxurious, pragmatic clothing and personal styling to today's busy professional woman. Just fill out a quick online survey and one of their discerning stylists will send you a bento box of wardrobe staples, handpicked just for you based on your preferences and lifestyle. They have plus sizes as well as straight sizes, which is why I'm so psyched to have them as a sponsor because I love supporting companies that are size inclusive. Once your bento arrives, you have four days to try everything on. Then keep what you like and send the rest back. You won't be charged anything up front and you'll only pay for the items you keep. It's completely free to try and even shipping is free both ways. And because it's not a subscription service, there's no commitment. To try a bento yourself, visit mmbento.com. That's M-M-B-E-N-T-O dot com. Use the offer code PSYCH, that's P-S-Y-C-H, at checkout and M.M. LaFleur will donate 10% of profits to global giving. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Kai Hibbard. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Well, growing up, I had an older sister, but she's about 13 years older than me. So she wasn't in my home much when I was little. And I have a younger sister and my younger sister and I are two very, very different body types. To give an example, our nicknames as children were pumpkin and peanut. You can guess which one I was. So I like to say that I was built like a brick shit house. It's kind of <laughs> how I reframe that for myself and paying attention to that about myself and about what my body looked like as a child, as a very active child, mind you. I played soccer. I played outdoors every day. I took tap dance lessons and my parents always had us in activities. However, my relationship with food was distorted by both my parents and they both know that I talk about this when I talk about my childhood. My father was a lifelong member of the United States Coast Guard. And because of that service to his country, he was forced to do PT tests and weigh-ins, I think almost yearly. And so that repetitive anxiety in my home, every time that that was creeping up because I was built more like my father than my mother. So he struggled with the ramifications on his career if his weight didn't conform to what the military standard was at the time. And it's, it's funny, but not funny when you look at it from a psychological aspect that I repeated that same process myself when I joined the army as an adult. Yeah, that is fascinating. Right. Yeah. I, I repeated that same struggle. And then my mother, 
My mother's a very tiny woman anyway. She's 4'11". And she comes from a household where I can remember. So I'm, I'm Chamorro. We're the indigenous people of the Marianas Islands. And that's on my mom's side of the family. And for some reason, my grandfather propagated a pretty strong weight standard on women. There was a very big push on traditional women's roles. My grandmother, I think maybe occasionally worked out of the home, but it was very rare. And I can remember when we would visit my mother's family in Cape Cod, my grandfather would incessantly comment on my mother's weight. Oh, how much much weight have you gained? You look like you've gained a little weight there. Yeah. And so my mother was both anorexic And also she was what I would term, she had exercise anorexia. So when she wasn't restricting her food, she was exercising to excess. And there was a point in time where she became so frail and so tiny that I can remember holidays. And we lived in Hawaii, just to give a little context at the time. But my mother was so tiny and had such little body fat on her body. She was perpetually freezing even in Hawaii. Oh my God. Yeah, you can see the old family videos and my mother is listless and having difficulty lifting her head even on the couch at certain points in my childhood. So that I think began to frame my concept of my body and my concept of eating. In addition, when we moved, we moved from Hawaii. We were a military family, obviously. When we moved from Hawaii, we moved to New Jersey and my mother experienced a series of incredibly traumatic events that... This is a little tangential, but I'm thinking of the Me Too campaign that's going on on social media right now. And and I sort of want to name that hashtag, you know, how many times as opposed to Me Too is how I feel about that for all the women that I know. And my mother, unfortunately, experienced a traumatic event like that after some in her childhood as well. And it began to manifest in her her disordered eating taking different forms because she gained weight and was so rooted with her identity in being this frail, tiny, almost trophy-like woman. Because my father, also for the dynamics of the relationship, my mother wasn't a full human being. I can see that in retrospect as a child, I didn't get it. But my mother was a trophy to my father. So she began Weight Watchers when I was about in the third or fourth grade and took me with her. Oh my God. Yeah. So... From there started a really unhealthy pattern of yo-yo dieting. Yeah, it's unconscionable that they allow children that young to come into Weight Watchers. And I was actually just talking to someone recently who said they had to sign a special form or something to let her be let in as a child because it's just, it shouldn't be. It's not right. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I... I was so at the beginning of the whole movement that they didn't even have awareness of stuff like that. I know the American Pediatric Association now recommends not putting your children on any type of restricted Mm -hmm. dieting. This was the 80s, so that was not a thing at the time. And I know that my mother absolutely came from a place that she thought was love because I was incessantly bullied for my size. When we moved to New Jersey, it was it seemed to be a non-issue when we lived in Hawaii. And then when we moved to New Jersey, it made me a target of bullies. I think that's one advantage I've had throughout my childhood that we relocated geographically so often that though I became victim to diet culture repeatedly throughout my life over and over, Part of me still remained galvanized a bit to it because I had these experiences. One I like to really touch on when I speak with adolescent girls is when I lived in New Jersey, I was constantly, constantly ridiculed and picked on and bullied for the size of my body. And my freshman year of high school, we moved to North Carolina where there was a completely different standard of beauty for women. And I went from being ridiculed almost daily to being pursued by young men. And I was very, very confused. And I didn't understand what was going on. And the one concept that I did grasp, though, that ended up becoming very important to me in recovery and later on in my life was that absolutely, literally nothing changed about my body. The only thing that changed was my geographical location, which taught me that Whether somebody tells me that my body disgusts them or they find my body beautiful means not a fucking thing about my body. All it means is what their biases are. Oh, that's such a wonderful lesson to learn. And so many people don't don't have the opportunity to learn that. So what a powerful thing to be able to see that transition. 
and, and to get it so young. And if I'd been able to hold on to it longer, but it came back to me in pieces in my life later on where I was going through processes where I was like, this is not okay. I can't, I can't quantify why this is not okay, but my participation in this is giving me really bad cognitive dissonance. And I'm, I'm really big on, we're all hypocrites. Let's just put it out there. We're all hypocrites to some degree, but it's my goal to live my truth as often and as best as I possibly can, even when it makes my life difficult. And, you know, I hope that one day when I die, we're all going to die that my headstone said, you know, she was honest, even with herself. And, and that's my goal. Yeah. And that cognitive dissonance, I think, is such a great barometer for that. It's your intuition really telling you you're not living in line with your values. And so, yes, yeah, being able to, to feel and honor that, I think, is a huge gift. It's an amazing gift. I see people who are a lot older than I am and they're unhappy or they're unfulfilled and they haven't done what they wanted to do in their life. And I think a lot of it is because they're not able for whatever reason to walk their talk. And I've been honored that I've had the courage. And and I think honestly being, and I'm using fat as a descriptor because it's a descriptor that I embrace, being a fat kid and enduring what I endured from other people and their biases and their values they tried to place on my body really galvanized me to have strength to withstand it as I got older. And don't get me wrong, I failed. I have failed in lots of different ways to pressure, to diet culture, to healthism. I've agreed to medical treatments and to medical treatment paradigms that I, I never would have had I been aware of the, the fat acceptance community sooner or if I stood stronger in that truth. However, I think that I could have been a lot worse off. Mm. Yeah, I think it's hard to stand strong in that truth forever in diet culture, right? It's it's hard to, you know, if you don't have a community around you that's supporting you and that sort of names the problem and names the solution, like knowing that it is diet culture and knowing that there is such a thing as fat acceptance and health at every size. I think that is so important and powerful in helping people stay rooted. But if you don't know that, or even if you do, you know, because there are folks listening who are part of this movement who waver and have have their journeys and their relapses and things like that, too. And that's OK. That's all a part of it. But I think really knowing the truth of it and being able to have a supportive system is relatively rare in this society because it is diet culture, because diet culture has its little tendrils and everything from yes. your doctor's office to schools, to friends, to your entertainment, entertainment, your family, like it's everywhere. Even bonding rituals with women. Yes. I find that, you know, that's it's a bonding ritual to hate on your body when you meet with or you get into a group with a bunch of other women. And I found that it's made some social interactions uncomfortable that I won't hate on my body to make you more comfortable. And sometimes it makes for difficult interactions. I feel that so hard like that <laughs> for sure. It's it's an interesting thing to like meet with new people and try to bond with women, especially being so rooted and feeling like it's such a matter of integrity to me to not do that. I like have to dance and tiptoe around these issues so carefully or just come out and say it and be like the party pooper, you know, be like, <laughs> well, that's... actually, I don't believe in this, you know. <laughs> And that is me. I am the consummate bull in a china shop when it comes to this. <laughs> Two years ago, I literally was getting ready to embark on a, on a girl's trip to Mexico with some women that I'd known for a very long time and who I love very much. But I understood that a couple of the women attending were very, very rooted still in diet culture and that the language that they used about themselves, even not necessarily about me by any means, was very damaging to my my recovery at the time. And, and I understand that relapse is part of recovery. So I tried to guard my recovery very carefully. And so I issued a list of body positive boundaries before I was willing to go and embark on this vacation. And I it ended up ending a relationship, a friendship of 16 years. It was very difficult. Wow. Yeah, that's heartbreaking, but also so powerful f for you to have done that. And like, I think that speaks to how important it is and how much of a value it was to you to protect your recovery. Yes. I'm always telling people about boundaries because this is such a common thing that people ask me in my courses and my clients and stuff or people just writing in with questions from the podcast. It's always coming up like how do I deal with my friends and family and people around me who are still rooted in diet culture? How do I talk to them? How do I not get triggered by them? And I think boundaries are 
such an important part of it, but boundaries do make you kind of the bull in the china shop sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And and I'm sure if like somebody contacted her right now, it would be like, oh, Kai was so mean. And you know what? I'm willing to accept that label. Like sometimes I have to be mean. I fiercely protect other people with every part of me. And it's only since I've reached my mid thirties that I'm willing to fiercely protect myself. And it's just the way it is. Oh my God, I feel you. I'm, I think we're about the same age and I'm also coming into that in my mid thirties. Like it feels like, okay, now I can really do this boundary setting thing. And I have so much practice at not doing it and how that turns out that I'm just, yes. I'm done. I'm over it. <laughs> yes. Know? I'm, I'd reach oh. that point. Yeah. Yes. Well, so how did you get there? Let's, let's go back to that sort of transition into moving to North Carolina and that pivotal moment in childhood. But then also, of course, we need to talk about how did you get from there to the biggest loser and what that experience was like. I mean, oh my God, talk about diet culture. (laughs) Uh, Right. It's like the epitome. Like if I could have, I went big. I tell everybody that like lots of people do things that are really stupid in their 20s and I I went big. (laughs) So after graduating from high school, I went back to college in Hawaii. And from there, I went to college in Alaska. And I, being the person that I am, I occasionally bite off way more than I should be chewing. And at the time, when I was finishing up my undergrad work, I was a double major and a minor. So I was taking about 21 credits a semester. And I was, oh my God. Yeah. And I was working three jobs. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one of those jobs included aerobics instructor, I was a certified aerobics instructor. I have I've never been what anybody would, well, that's not true. I, I'll touch on that later on. But I was going to say, I've never been what anybody would term a thin individual. So I was even an anomaly when I went and got my aerobics instructor certification. My body was much larger than everybody else there. And I'll tell you what, I was still damn good at my job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it didn't have any bearing on it. And so not only was I instructing aerobics at the time, in addition to working my two other jobs, I ran the aerobics program at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska, in Anchorage, Alaska. And so running that program meant that any time that any of my instructors bailed on their classes and couldn't show, I taught their classes. So while I was doing this entire course load, working the two other jobs and running this aerobics program, my habits were incredibly poor in the sense of I obviously was not paying attention to the cues that my body was giving me to eat. I had long ago since stomped out those cues based on the yo-yo dieting and the restricting that I had done for years. And so I had come into a routine where I was going to school, working all day, sometimes teaching aerobics classes a day to make up for instructors. And I wouldn't eat anything until I'd make it home at about 10 o'clock at night. Then I would eat whatever was handiest in my fridge. It didn't, it didn't really matter. I wasn't paying attention to like what my body needed or what I was craving. And it worked for a time because I was young. I mean, the same way at the time I was young and I could go out drinking and partying and get up at 6 a.m. and teach an aerobic class. If you tried to ask me to do that today, I'm pretty sure I would die. Oh, same. On the gym floor, like it just wouldn't happen. I'm gonna be like, I'm dead. Enjoy yourselves. Go work out. (laughs) So I was essentially abusing my body in this whole process. So once I graduated from undergrad, I had applied to law schools. I had taken the LSAT. I was accepted for a full ride scholarship to law school, but I had six months of I don't have to work. I've managed to save up enough money. I don't have to do anything. I'm just waiting to leave for law school. So I quit all my jobs. I was like, woo, I'm free, including the aerobics job. But however, I continued the same eating habits where I wouldn't eat all day long and then inhale whatever I could find in my fridge and then pass out on my face. Was it kind of like a restrict binge cycle, would you say? Yeah, it it wasn't a deliberate restrict binge cycle as in something that like I was trying to restrict all day because I was trying to achieve a a weight or do anything like that, which, which I have done in the past as well. It was more of a, this is just how I eat now because I run, run, run all day long. And then I worry about getting nutrients into my body but I wasn't choosing nutrients, you know, like n- nobody in their right mind, their body doesn't crave jelly beans after running all day like that. Don't get me wrong. I have days when I need jelly beans, but that's not all I needed. And I wasn't, I wasn't aware enough or in tune enough to know that I needed other things to keep going. It was like, this is energy. This will do, you know, what, Oh, I found a starburst on the couch, whatever. Okay, great. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's, that's the extent of my paying attention to my nutrition at the time. And my body responded as anybody that's been abused for over a year at this point in time by fluctuating and changing. And for me, that fluctuation looked like rapid weight gain. At other points in my life, for instance, right now, I have a chronic illness. I have rheumatoid arthritis and I also have fibromyalgia. My body looks very different than it did two years ago. I, I've fluctuated in the other direction and I'm struggling with that now, but that's a tangential story. So at that point in time, I was like, okay, well, my body isn't in a space that I've been comfortable with and that I'm used to, but you know, I'm going to law school in the fall. I'll get back into a routine when I'm in a comfortable routine, then my body will fall back to where I naturally fall. And where I naturally fall is not what is traditionally considered in our society thin by any means, but it's where I have learned to be very comfortable with my body. It took me years and years to love my body at that size. And it took embracing what I can do at that size and ignoring society telling me in all the subtle ways it does, like having to order my clothes online and not being able to walk into a straight size store and find something to wear. But I've learned to tune that all out and accept it. I had decided, cool, I'll just, I'm sure my body will revert back to its set point once I'm in a regular routine again. That's a pretty high degree of body acceptance to have achieved, you know, even at that point, right? It's like that must have come from some level of the seed being planted already for you at that time. I think it came from being at what most people would deem as not an acceptable weight and being an aerobics instructor and being part of my lack of humility here, but damn good at it. Mm. I was damn good at it. <laughs> And I think it came from, you know, teaching classes to all body types and all sizes and really kind of being aware of the fact that the body type that is being most embraced and worshipped by society wasn't necessarily keeping up with my strength and my abilities. And I preferred my strength and my abilities to an aesthetic. So it was, it was okay. It was working for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. However, at the time, my roommate, who was also, unfortunately, the friendship I ended after 16 years, she was my best friend at the time, was a fitness competitor. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oof. So, yes. I'm um, like, if, if you have any awareness of the fitness competition community, you will understand the level of disordered eating. Oh, yeah. We've had a couple of guests, a number of guests, actually, whose disordered eating was really sparked off by deciding to, oh, I'll just do this bikini competition or I'll just do this fitness competition. And, and woof, yes, the disordered eating behaviors that are taught in that world are just off the charts. And that is exactly the lifestyle she had embraced at the time. So... Along with embracing that lifestyle, she, to this day, has internalized a lot of fat phobia and is very, very invested in her thin privilege, no matter what she sacrifices for it. And she had seen the show. I had never seen an episode of The Biggest Loser before I went on it, which blows people's minds <laughs> when I say that. Because like, what kind of crazy human being goes on a reality TV show they'd never seen. I literally thought, well, this will be a cool story to tell my kids one day, like my 15 minutes of fame. So she approached me after seeing the finale of the most recent season, season two. And she said, basically, hey, I love you, but you've gained a lot of weight. And there's this show and they desperately need a female winner. I know what you're like when you're actually in the shape that you embrace or whatever. And I think that this could be a really cool thing for you. Also, you have, and I'm sure this is an absolute metric of measurement, but fuck ton of student loan debt. <laughs> and, and this would be a way to pay off your student loans. At first, I sort of blew it off. She showed me the last five minutes of the finale of um, season two, where I saw contestant Susie get up on this giant, ridiculous prop scale and do a little happy kick. And I was like, eh, meh. I went out on New Year's Eve with a bunch of girlfriends, and I remember being infinitely frustrated at the lack of what I felt was cute and comfortable clothing to go out on New Year's Eve versus my girlfriends. Because first of all, I was in Anchorage, Alaska, where you've got limited shopping available anyway. 
And let's face it, we live in a world where some reason people think that all plus size women want to wear garments that match the drapes in the room. Mm. I don't know if they want us to blend in. I don't know what the deal is there. Yeah, it makes it easy to hide. Exactly. Like that seems to be the selection. Yeah. It's ridiculous too, because like 68% of women or 60, what is it? Yeah. 67% of women or something are plus size. So what the fuck? Seriously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, I believe the average size in America for women is is plus size at this yeah. point. So it's ridiculous that you have to go to like some dimly lit back corner of like, your <laughs> local store to find an outfit that doesn't make you look like Aunt Edna's drapes. Seriously. Yeah. So I was, I was pretty frustrated. And so I woke up in that classy way I have sometimes hung over on New Year's Day and I made a video. And I sent that video along with my application into the television show and thought, well, that was a fun lark. That was funny and promptly forgot about it. And then four months later, I found myself contacted by a production company out of LA that said, hey, we're sending you plane tickets. Get on a plane. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, okay, this will be a fun little blip. I honestly got on that plane thinking that I was going to be turning around and coming back within seven days. That didn't happen. I ended up cast on the show and I was there on the ranch in California for four and a half months. And then my finale for the show was in December of that year. So they just kept you there the whole time? Yes. Oh my God. For my season, I have no idea and I can't attest to what happens on later seasons. But for my season, I was kept isolated on a ranch for four months with other contestants and the isolation at that point, social media was just a burgeoning thing because I'm ancient (laughs) and it wasn't, it wasn't really a thing yet. Even if it had been, uh, they confiscated my laptop when I got there. I didn't have, um, and they confiscated my phone. So we didn't have access to the internet. We didn't have access to our phones and they, and I'm sure this is illegal, but they censored our mail. They would open and they would redact our mail because they were afraid that we would find out drama-filled information from home and they wouldn't get it on camera and it would ruin their show. They were also afraid we would write out show secrets in our letters that we sent home to people. So they redacted our mail that we sent out. And then when we were finally allowed, something like six to eight weeks in, we were allowed phone calls home with family and they were limited to about five minutes at a time. And we had to have a production assistant stand over us the entire time to make sure we weren't quote unquote revealing show secrets. It sounds like prison. It was the most beautiful prison I've ever been to. Is how we <laughs> were to it. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful location. And I lived in a home that like otherwise I couldn't ever have ever dreamed of being in. And it was a prison. It was a beautiful, beautiful prison. So I was there for months and I, and I didn't start to get, I didn't start to get an idea that I had fallen through the rabbit hole until right near the end of being in that, that prison. They kept us on my season anyway, very isolated from the doctor associated with the show. They also, there was a registered dietitian attached to the show. However, when she came in to give us advice, I will say I, other contestants from other seasons found her helpful. And, and I, after the show, I did find her helpful when I spoke with her. But during it, they production made sure to intercept any advice or anything that she was giving us. However, she was still a diet-based dietitian, which I kind of, you know, yeah. at this point. Totally. But she was probably, it was like on the continuum of full-blown diet culture to like health at every size. She was probably a few steps closer to the health at every size, Absolutely. even though nowhere near it. But like, because of what you went through and everything that they recommended was not something any dietitian, even the most diet-based dietitian would ever co-sign. No. And, and and I say that because specifically in the, the calorie numbers that she was recommending for us. However, even now, the amount of calories that she was recommending for us, I think that I read a stat somewhere. Don't quote me. I'd have to find the research. I like to cite sources when I make statements, but it was a caloric level that would be suitable for a woman of much smaller stature than myself, like in a coma. Not for a woman of my size doing 
hours of workouts a day. Right. And that's the thing with with calorie counting diets, too. They really are sort of the bare minimum needed for survival, like not with movement. Yes. right? And everything, all these diets that people think of are printed in women's magazines and people think are reasonable diets for weight loss are actually starvation diets or semi-starvation diets. And so, of course, you're going to end up feeling nutso around food after a few months on that or even a few weeks on that, right? Or a few days, like whatever it is, your body's ultimately going to rebel because it's being starved. Absolutely. Starved. And and so then she would try to make these recommendations and do her best to insert herself, but production consistently interfered along with our trainers. So the caloric recommendations she was making were being slashed almost in half. Jesus. So it was even worse than what had appeared on television. What they were telling the viewing community we were doing was not at all what we were doing to achieve the results that they wanted aesthetically on the show. So the dietitian was basically there just to give sort of a veneer of palatability or okayness to the whole thing. Yes, absolutely. And and she also wasn't there full time. That's the other thing. They, the show presents it as though your doctor monitored and registered dietitian monitored and psychologist monitored the entire time. And that's a flat out fucking lie. Mm. That's a lie. There was a point in time I saw the psychologist once and I believe he was a side D for my assessment. And they basically do an assessment on you to make sure you're not going to snap too much. Because don't get me wrong, reality TV wants you to snap a little bit. I mean, of course they do. They're exercising you for hours a day. They are starving you and they want drama for a good television show. So they deliberately look for volatile personalities. And I am one. I'll acknowledge that. (laughs) But they don't want you too volatile because you've heard about, I'm sure, some of the really horrible, awful things and events that have occurred on reality TV in recent times. Stuff that has led to suicide and sexual assaults and the ethics surrounding reality TV are are pretty sketchy as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she was there, but she wasn't accessible to us while we were there. And like I said, I saw this ID originally to have my assessment and then we did not see him again. I personally did not see him again until one contestant was really struggling and demanded they bring him back. And I remember when they brought him back, I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but I feel like Alice through the looking glass. And the gentleman basically patted me on the head and was like, you'll be fine. <laughs> and that oh. was about it. Oh my God. And, and somebody who is right now finishing up her master's in social work and is in her clinical practicum, I'm horrified that that was the level of therapeutic care that I got throughout this process. Yeah. Oh, God, there are some really unscrupulous people out there, I think, of any profession and therapists yes. included. So it's like Absolutely. the reality show industry finds them, right, and brings in trainers or therapists or dietitians who are sort of willing to like look the other way. Hey, money's a big motivator. It really is. Yeah. That, like that's why diet culture is proliferated so well. I mean, it's, it, what is it? Something with, between like a 60 and $90 billion a year industry. I know. Yeah. Depending on how you calculate all the sneaky forms of diet culture, uh-huh. like the, the juice cleanses and the, the wellness industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know money is a huge motivator and I, and for the show too. I mean, that seems to be both a motivator for the network and the producers of the show, but also for the people they bring on the show like you, like you said, you know, this this promise of being able to pay off your student loans. Like, I think that that is so sad and so real that a lot of us have a lot of debt and we need help. Right. When you think about the intersections of the layers of marginalization of people you're approaching to be contestants on this show, it's even more abhorrent that money is a part of the motivator. Because when you look at how poverty and how systems of oppression in the society affect body size and affect eating disorder behavior, it, it becomes even more disgusting that you're preying on the most vulnerable of society when you've got fat bias the way that you have it and the way that poverty keeps people down in this country. And I, you know, I started out originally with a a motivational goal of money of participating in this, this program. But another part of the brainwashing when you get there is they have you convinced that you were about to drop dead before you set foot on that show. And logically, I was teaching aerobics. I may have not have been eating best, but I was not on the brink of death. Like, I'll put it that way. But by the time I got home from the ranch to finish up the last part of the show where you do filming at home and you continue at home, I was absolutely convinced that if I hadn't done this and I wasn't doing this, that I was going to die at any moment. 
they had me convinced. And, and I believe that that's a big motivator for a lot of the participants on the show. They believe that they're going to die at any moment. And data just doesn't support that. No, not at all. And I think that's how diet culture has co-opted the health field, right? And the medical industrial complex. It's all under the sway of diet culture with this sort of veneer of seeming like it's for your health, it's for your own good, right? But actually, it's fat phobia. And it's it's fat phobic interpretations of the data that show, yes, a correlation between higher weights and certain disease outcomes, certain chronic disease states. But also, actually, the data don't show a higher a correlation between higher weights and higher mortality. In fact, no. the risk for, of mortality is lower for people in larger bodies, and it's the highest for people in the so-called underweight body mass index category. And that conveniently gets left out of the discourse on the quote unquote obesity epidemic all the time. People don't acknowledge that. Yes. The obesity paradox. And, you know, so it's funny because I'm I, I'm finishing up my MSW and I'm in the course of applying to doctoral programs. And one of the things that I'm addressing, and it keeps coming up in my essays for these programs is will it really harsh and just angry response to Flagle's data mm -hmm. about it. I, I don't know if you've seen the, the controversy over that in journals, but when Flagle's metadata analysis came out showing that um, Andreas's original U-curve in the obesity paradox, her data supported it. Willett out of Harvard was incensed at the results and literally orchestrated a symposium and a panel to dispute it. And the backlash was just awe-inspiring to me. I was so surprised. Yeah, Walter Willett is so invested in diet culture that he can't conscience any sort of data that contradicts what he believes. But this data, I mean, Catherine Flagel had had repeated that too, right? It was yes, it, this, yes. this most recent study she did was a repeat of a study that she had done about 10 years ago or so that found the same thing. And that, yeah, Andreas's U-curve was the same thing, whatever, a decade or I don't even know how long before that. Yeah, it was at least a decade before that. And she she substantiated it. And even after making the allowances and adjustments that Willard had complained about, she came back <laughs> with the same results. And yeah, he's just super, super invested in diet culture. And I, you know, and, and for me, so I'm coming at the approach of it with the programs that I'm looking at, because I know that you're a master's in public health, and I am looking at a couple doctoral and public health programs that I'm applying to, is that I would really like to see integration of the context of psychological and social welfare and social justice issues on this whole, and I'm air quoting, obesity epidemic, because, you know, we're looking at data, but we're not paying attention to the fact that humans are not data points and that there is a better public health approach to the entire thing that maybe you can look at Flagle's data and Willett's data and go, okay, I see that. I understand the perspective. But what if we look at all the psychological ramifications and come up with a public health strategy that addresses behavioral issues? Because, you know, they found in the data that loneliness is a bigger, it's, it's got a higher correlation with mortality than, and I hate this word because it's so, it makes it sound like my body shape and my weight or a clinical thing, but then obesity is. Right. That's the term they use in the data. Yeah, it, it annoys me, just like the term overweight, as though there's some specific weight that you're supposed to be and you just shot over it. It's uh, the most annoying term. It's why I embrace fat. But, you know, it fails to look at, okay, so this is the data. So, so what? <laughs> in, in the sense of, you know, like if we can shift the paradigm away from sounding the alarm and these doctors like terrifying people to the point where, you know, statistics and data are showing that people in larger bodies aren't going to the doctors and they're not moving their bodies for joy and they're not doing things that are behavioral changes that could promote longevity, even if they don't reduce weight like people who are mired in fat phobia want them to. And I'd like to see a paradigm shift in public health address that. Yes. That's where I want to go. Oh, my God. Same here. I, I <laughs> would love that. One piece of it that, well, a couple of things I think that have been so heartening to see is the data on weight stigma that keeps coming out, that weight stigma could explain all of the higher incidence of chronic disease conditions seen in people in larger bodies, not weight itself, right? That weight stigma is actually 
probably the a mediator. Bigger impact. It's yeah, the bigger a bigger impact than the body size itself. It's like, you can't see me, but I'm like I'm raising my <laughs> arms and I'm like cheering. And so that's where I was tying in the loneliness data because if you've got weight stigma, you're going to isolate, which is going to stop you from making meaningful connections, which is going to up the loneliness factor in your life. And we've already found that there's a correlation between mortality and loneliness. So why wouldn't you actively take public health steps to reduce weight stigma so that you could at least approach this barrier to health to increase longevity and public health? Yes, totally. Yes. That is my <laughs> mission as well as a person with a public health degree is really to change the discourse and to help people yes. see that this is this is actually a public health issue. Like this podcast is a, a public health intervention. I see it as that. Absolutely. I really want people and I do have, you know, dietitians and physicians and therapists and stuff listening too. And it's so cool to meet people at conferences and have them say like, you've changed the course of my career. Like hearing about this stuff has helped me stop stigmatizing my my clients. So I feel like this message is starting to get out there and it is starting to change people's practices of health. And that's great. But I think, you know, public health as a field certainly has a long way to go because there is this side, this thread of public health. And I see it because I went to NYU for, I did my master's in public health nutrition. I was really, I was a Got it. journalist okay. first. Yeah. So I was a journalist covering food and nutrition. And when I decided to go back to school, I wanted to do a program that had a registered dietitian's license and some sort of master's revolving around nutrition policy. Yeah. Because that was something that, you know, at the time, of course, being steeped in diet culture and the food movement, you know, like the real food movement, I was really heavily influenced by Michael Pollan and people like that. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's about food access and it's about helping people in low-income communities get access to fruits and vegetables and therefore reduce the obesity epidemic. You know, that was my framing of it at the time because that's what I knew because that's, yeah. you know, what diet culture had instilled in me. And thank God I went to this program at NYU because I had a professor there who was, I came to learn later, like a big person, a big researcher in the field of social determinants of health. Oh, yes. That's a, that's the, what I want to look at. Yes. yes. He's yes. amazing. James Masinko. I don't know if he's still there, but I just took this class because everyone was like, oh, I hear this class is great. Everybody says, take it. Like, you know, so I, I enrolled in this class. I wasn't really sure what I was going to find, but that was sort of the first crack in the wall of he presented this research showing like actually stigma and poverty and oppression of all different kinds has a lot more influence on people's health outcomes than how they eat or how they move their body or their body size. And so that was kind of like, whoa, okay. I'm, take, I'm taking notes right now that <laughs> you said his name because I'm going to go look up research right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank He's you. Amazing. Yes. Absolutely. I'm totally looking at doctoral and public health programs. And I'm obviously coming at it from a social work with a social justice lens. And then my undergrad degrees are in psychology and justice. And I'm really looking at doctoral and public health programs with a behavioral and social focus. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's what I'm really... So fingers crossed, all my applications are heading out like this month. So. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I'm going to look forward to hearing how that goes because I feel like we need more people doing that work and also being... I mean, you have such great skills in communication and sort of reaching a lay audience too. And I think we need more people in academia who have that skill. I love people who are just really steeped in the research and can talk about it in a way that's like accessible to, to a lay audience. Personal and relatable because I yeah. have my own personal story that I put out there. Absolutely. Yep. And I think it's so interesting. I mean, talking about that background and that sort of academic focus that you had, I, I just had at the time we're recording this, I just released an episode about fat phobia in woke spaces and how people who are really into social justice and working to to change, to reverse oppression of all kinds like racism and sexism and homophobia and things like that, still those communities don't quite get that fat phobia is a thing that we also, you know, is a form of oppression that we also need to be fighting against. Yes. Melissa Toller just wrote a piece on this like yesterday, and I felt myself cheering as I read the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. She was just on. She, I, I talked with her about that piece and. Ah! Oh, That's so, so awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's a great company. <laughs> yeah, totally. I know. I love her. 
But yeah, no, I think it's so fascinating that people who get it in these ways, like you did and like I did too. I went through my own eating disorder history oh, yeah. and at the time that I was applying to go back to school and do this work and, you know, was really committed to what I thought was the social justice aspect of food policy. Come to find out later that orthorexia was really tied up in that and I had to sort of come to understand that, yes, food access is really important, but also it's not about changing people's size. It's not about using that to shrink people's bodies. It's about equality and justice, you know, period. And that actually body yeah. size is is a form of oppression, too, that we need to work to root out oppression based on body size. But going into it, I thought that I was this great social justice minded person. And I wasn't looking at my own internalized fat phobia that I projected onto other people and thought like, I need to save people from obesity. You know, <laughs> like, that was my, it was totally my internalized fat phobia coming out. And I've always lived in a thin body, but I've also always had internalized fat phobia towards myself because mm -hmm. we live in diet culture and that's what happens, yes. right? And that's, you know, that got instilled in me through my family and through various, all the things, right? The TV we watch and the people we hang out with and the doctors and all of this. So it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm curious that sort of transition for you then, because you had already done all this work and, you know, this undergraduate degree, then you went on The Biggest Loser. Where was the where was the cognitive dissonance or the transition for you and sort of seeing like, oh, my God, this is actually oppression, too? So I think it started to wake up for me on a personal level during the process of the show, only because my family staged an intervention. Because I had gotten to the point where I was basically doing things like counting a cup of black coffee as a meal while also exercising for hours on end. And my boyfriend at the time, who's actually now my husband, had I was I had moved to the East Coast because I was getting ready to start law school because that's where I thought my life was going. But the show needed me to film in Alaska because that was the shtick, my season. It was the 50 states and I was the girl from Alaska who had made the show. And so they flew me back and they'd fly me back about once a month for the time period that I was home from August until December. And my boyfriend had watched the changes as I got off the plane. And I believe in October, I got off the plane and I was wearing a hat because I thought I could hide it. But my hair was falling out in clumps and I had bald spots. I had black circles under my eyes. My body was completely covered in bruises. At that point, I had amenorrhea. My menses had completely stopped. And I looked, I mean, to like not, you know, parse words, I looked like shit. And I got off the plane and he was like, um, so about this look you've got going on right now. <laughs> well, couldn't hide it. And, no. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, yeah, okay. So he rounded up a couple of my really close friends and he called my parents because they lived in a different state and he put them on speakerphone and he was like, oh, we're going to go to dinner. <laughs> and uh, I walked into my very own intervention. <laughs> So basically, they were all like, hey, you might win this show, but you're probably going to drop dead there, nutball. So I fought it. I was like, you know, you're crazy. They wouldn't steer me wrong. I'm fine. And I was clearly not fine at all. And one of the defining moments that I was not fine is I remember I woke up in the middle of the night in his bed and I was so nutrient deficient and so bad off from working out or whatever that both of my both of my thighs, Charlie horsed at the same time. And it woke me up from a dead sleep and literally like threw me out of his bed. And it was so painful and I couldn't get them to stop cramping that I vomited all over myself on the floor, which I had just started dating him. So it was incredibly <laughs> sexy, if you might imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not the thing you want in your new boyfriend's bed. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. It's nice to meet you. You're welcome. So, so I was like, okay, I might have an issue. And so this very group of devoted people literally babysat me for the months from, I stayed in Alaska instead of returning back to the East Coast to prepare for law school. And they, they cut my workouts from the ridiculous amount of hours I was doing a day to a less number of ridiculous hours, but it's still not anything anybody should be doing on a daily basis. And they literally watched me to make sure I was eating. 
like watched me. Someone was with me every time I had a meal and, and God loved them. They would be like, that's cute that you're crying. Finish your food. Like they were really hard about it and they stayed on it. But even with that intervention, and they also took me to an MD and they took me to a registered dietitian and they got me to a therapist, for the love of God. Those are good friends. Right. Yeah. And so it was still just the beginning of my recovery because there was multiple relapses from there on. And I try to embrace the fact that I understand that relapse is part of recovery and I just hold on to that. But I was still in the middle of this whole thing with the show. And I was like, guys, you know, like I'm I'm so close to the finish line. I'm, I'm eating now. I'm doing what I can. But I was still pretty far gone. And recovery was still a lot of work. I It still worked today. It still worked today. Like I struggle. I'd, I'd finally come to a place where I really embraced like what my body could do regardless of size and was really very comfortable. Even after making the huge mistake of joining the army, like I don't, I'm not sure on what planet I thought joining a career field where my weight was a criteria to do my job was good idea after everything I went through. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But even after that and that whole process, and to be quite honest, I gained weight during basic training. So it wasn't necessarily a bad thing for me. Like I ate when I was there. So that was great. But even after all that, you know, I still struggle. I I mentioned earlier that I have rheumatoid arthritis and it took two years to get a diagnosis. And The reason it took two years is because I had to repeatedly fire doctors because I would show up in their office and I would get diagnosed fat. And I was like, well, yes, but however, I've been this fat and I've been even heavier than I am now. And I didn't have these issues I'm I'm telling you about right now. And, you know, at the time, I wish that I'd had access to um, this Reagan Chastain quote is amazing. And I will forever use it from here on out. When a doctor approaches me with that bullshit again, my response is going to be, yep, that's excellent. How would you treat this in a thin person? And when they say, I'm going to go, okay, cool, we're going to do that. And then another time, if I feel like it, we can discuss my body size, but it's not important right now. And I even had my worst encounter with an endocrinologist through this whole experience is I remember sitting in her office waiting for her to come in and she walked in and it became incredibly clear that she hadn't looked at my file or while I was there because she took one look at me and said, so how are you managing your diabetes? I don't have diabetes. I've never had diabetes. My blood sugars throughout my entire life have been perfect. She just looked at my body and assumed that that's why I was there. That's atrocious. Yeah, it was it was a pretty disgusting experience, the whole thing. And so when I finally received my diagnosis of seronegative RA and now I'm on I'm on injections and I'm on uh, various other medications, it's been a really long really long struggle. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why the medical field needs to know weight stigma hurts people. Weight stigma kills people, literally has killed people. Because if you have a condition that needs attention and that could worsen with inattention or with without treatment, and you're repeatedly diagnosed fat instead and given the prescription to lose weight, which does not work, you know, 98% of the time, right? Yep. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Like people are going to get illnesses are going to get worse. Some people are not going to make it like it's bad. It's a really huge public health crisis that we're going through. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty pissed off because I don't know how much you know about RA, but it can damage your internal organs. And so I spent two years where possibly my body was attacking itself and I won't know the repercussions for years. And it may have shortened my lifespan because they were so biased about my weight. Oh God, that breaks my heart. Right. It's just like I went through the broken heart stage and now I'm in the I'm really pissed off stage. So I would like to get the the education I need to go out there and be pissed off and do something with it. Oh, that's such a great response. (laughs) I love that so much. And I feel like that. I mean, it seems like you've always had sort of a fire in you and it can see that just from this idea of like firing your doctors. Right. Like that's not something that occurs to everyone. And it's something that I'm always advocating and always telling people like, no, they work for you. You know, you, you get to fire them if they're not doing their job that you hired them to do rather than have the other way around where they're this absolute authority that you have to listen to and that you're going to be disappointing them somehow if you don't do what they say. No, fuck that. Like they work for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But how did you come to that place? Like, how did you get to a place where you're finally like, okay, this doctor is not 
it was it the diabetes thing that was just like a bridge too far she was an easy one to fire like mm-hmm. that one was that was a no brainer and not only did i fire her i am like i don't have the i'd like to speak to the manager haircut but <laughs> my husband says that i have the i will speak to your manager and your manager's manager and your manager's manager's manager <laughs> face. Like I just walk into a room and people just know that shit is going to happen. And I'm a letter writer. So it'll be documented. And and to be quite honest, that woman was fired. And I don't want to be proud of the fact that I had a big bowl of schadenfreude for breakfast Mm -hmm. that morning, but I totally did. Yeah, of course. Right. Because mostly I'm like, how many other people's lives may I have impacted by having that go through? I went through patient advocacy. I contacted every executive at that hospital that I could. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that also it's going to sound like a a strange thing, but chronic illness changed me a lot. Don't get me wrong. I've always been, if you talk to people that have known me my whole life, and especially actually, if you talk to people that film the show, one of the things that really frustrated them with me as a quote unquote character on the show is usually you have these huge personality changes and these huge story arcs for people that you follow through the show. It drove them batshit insane that I was the exact same person at my starting weight as I was at my finale weight. My personality didn't change because I had had that concept of myself even though I got lost and fell through the rabbit hole there for a while and sucked into more fat phobia and thin privilege stuff, I still realized that regardless of what I weighed, I still had to pay my fucking mortgage at the end of the day. Like everybody does. Like maybe I don't have to suffer through the humiliation of asking for a seatbelt extender when everybody treats you like garbage when you fly anymore, but I still have the same damn awkward dating problems and I still have my mortgage to pay and my student loans. Nothing about me inherently changed. And I came to the realization that like, because it, first of all, weight loss isn't a fucking journey. That's the most bullshit sold thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And it's, we've turned it into some big emotional spiritual quest and it's bullshit. You're just re you're reshaping your body. And I decided instead of changing my fucking body, I want to change the fact that people feel shame because airlines or other people like that are so fucking greedy. They make their seats so small that people with average bodies can't fit in them anymore. I don't want to change me. I want to fucking change society. Fuck yes. <laughs> I love that. That's uh, such a powerful response to to what you went through. I, I think that, and I feel bad because this is terrible advice, especially coming from somebody with a therapeutic background right now. But like, people are like, how do you cope? And I'm like, I stay fucking angry. Mm-hmm. I stay angry. That's it. Like, and I think that a little bit of anger, especially about things that are bullshit in our world right now, and you can stay tuned to that. That's how you get shit done. And I think like the anger piece is so important. And I've talked about this with other folks on the podcast too. And I feel like that was also a big part of my journey as well was connecting my own struggles and what I went through to this larger sociological phenomenon and seeing yes. like I wasn't broken. There's nothing to be ashamed of. My body was doing what bodies do in response to starvation and diet culture is what makes us go through that starvation and restriction. And like diet culture is the problem. We're not the problem, you know, and that that's so fucking empowering and just such a nice breath of fresh air to clear out the shame. Like, I think when you can get to that place of connecting with other people who have gone through this stuff and getting angry in community also about how fucked up this is and feeling empowered and and supported to take steps to change that in whatever way is given to you. Like you're the letter writer, right? And you're the the speak to your manager face person. Like we need people <laughs> yeah. like you. And also we need people who are, you know, doing other things, right? Like people who are going to build a website or people who are going to, you know, whatever Absolutely. it is, like whatever your skill set is that you bring to the table. I mean, me, I'm a journalist. I'm a speaker. I don't necessarily speak to the manager. Like that's you know <laughs> my, my personal life, I'm a little like less willing to sort of put myself on a limb like that, but I'm doing what I have skills to do, you know, and and working on the other stuff too. <laughs> well, it took me a really, really long time to figure out what my piece was and where I fit because I I don't have obviously like the skill set that you have or the education that you have. And I'm going to choose to go a different way. Like I didn't choose to go to med school. That's not where my strengths lie. But I've learned that what I am is I'm a disruptor. 
I am a disruptor. That is where my skill set lies. My goal is to use this loud ass voice, this white privilege that I've been given and disrupt the shit out of things so that maybe I can amplify the voices of other people that aren't being heard. And then I can sit down, shut the fuck up and let them speak Mm. and let the people who have solutions to the problems I've identified do their damn work and get out of their way. I love that. I love that so much. Like Disruptor is such an important person to have in this movement because the status quo needs to be disrupted. And we can't do that with more of the status quo. I mean, there's way, you know, there's certainly a place for small changes or, or planting a seed for people. But I think we also need the big changes and the big disruption and just like turning over the table and just being like, fuck <laughs> yeah. no, you know? Yes. And, and it took me a long time to frame what I could do in this movement in that way, because I did feel kind of like, you know, I find a lot of people and I'm trying, I don't know if this, I can't remember if this is another Audrey Lord quote, I believe it is though, about like the way you give away your power is believing that you don't have any. And I'm not, I'm not going to pretend I have the solution. I know that there are millions of more brilliant people out there who are working right now on solutions and changing things and understanding statistics and data and medical information that I am never going to understand because it's impossible to learn everything I want to learn before I drop dead. However, I do have this and I feel like I have a responsibility to myself, to my moral compass and to my community and to the world to use what I do have. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's so brilliant. And also you're getting trained as a therapist and you're getting further education, PhD. Like I feel like that's also just going to add to the ability for you. Like it's, it's almost like a suit of armor. You know, I see my credentials in a way too, as like a suit of armor where I'm just like, nope, you can't pierce me because I have this, like I've gone through this establishment route to come out the other side and be anti-establishment, but people can't be like, oh, well, what do you know? You're just a whatever, you know? It's like, nope, I also did the training that you did and here's my point of view, right? I learned the rules so that I can break them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So important. And I know it's a privilege to have an access to that education. I'm completely aware of it, which is why I also feel a responsibility to use it in the best way I can for my community. Totally. Yeah. No, that's 100%. So are you looking to to work as a therapist, do you think? Or do you want to work more in academia or? To be quite honest, I absolutely shied away from working as a therapist whatsoever because of circumstances with the MSW program that I'm in and the state that we happen to be stationed in right now. Because although I'm no longer in the military, my husband is. And because of state requirements here, I needed more clinical classes in order to work as any type of social worker in the state. And so my final practicum, which I'm wrapping up right now to graduate in May, is a clinical-based one. And I'm doing individual therapy, and I was terrified which everybody keeps reassuring me is a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I'm finding that I really, I really, really like it. So I think that even, even if I do, you know, knock on wood, fingers crossed, everything you can think of, get the opportunity to pursue a doctoral degree. I am going to continue and take the steps to get licensure to be an LCSW eventually. So that if I do choose to do individual therapy, I can, and I'm qualified for that, but I'm really, really interested in teaching. I'd like, I think I'd really like it. I, just the idea of being in a room full of people who want to learn and want to go out and change the world and maybe some little thing or some little passion that I have sparks a mind 10,000 times more brilliant than mine to go out and do something amazing in the world seems like the most rewarding experience in the world to me. Oh, yeah. I feel like you'd be so good at that. Just talking with you this hour that we've been talking and picking up on your passion. It's like, it's infectious. It's exciting. I feel like you'd be so great at that. That's what I kind of hope to do with it. Yeah. That's so cool. Well, tell us more where people can find you and learn more about what you're up to now and and read some of your writing online because you're also doing some great writing. Oh, I I don't know if I would call it great, but thank you. I appreciate that. Usually it's ranting. (laughs) Which is my favorite kind of writing. (laughs) (laughs) Right now, you can actually pick up some of my academic stuff if you do a search with, I do all of my academic stuff under the last name is, you're going to, it's the most ridiculous last name. The last name is Swierstra. And so it's Z-W-I-E-R-S-T-R-A. 
So if you search Kai Swerster, you'll pull up. Um, I just this past year had a peer reviewed journal article published and there's one that has been submitted and is in consideration right now. I'm hoping that one is going to get picked up for publication. That's so exciting. It was really exciting. It was a huge monumental thing for me. Like it was better than my birthday party. I also have a website, which is just kaihibbard.com. It's me ranting. It's my not safe for work language right now. Like there were blogs, but right now it's mostly video blogs because I don't have time with all the writing I'm doing to finish up my, my grad degree. So you can catch a couple of videos of me talking about well, one of the most recent ones, what was my experience at the beta and then the any DA conference and how amazing it was. Another one I put up there and this one always, it never ceases to piss people off. So it amuses me a bit is how clean eating is bullshit. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a marketing term. It's not a nutritional path. It's bullshit. Yes. I love it. Yeah. There's another piece up there too, because Halloween just came and it was basically how not to be a dick on Halloween. Like it seems <laughs> like you wouldn't have to put up a blog about that, but you get people that body shame every year. Oh yeah. This day and age, you really do have to say that. Right? Like just don't be, I, I, the whole video is literally me being like, is your bite-sized Snickers really that important to you that you get to determine who's deserving of it? I'll seriously <laughs> buy you more. Just, just give them out and shut up. But like, and if you want to give out like non candy based treats, that's awesome. Also, especially for the teal pumpkin project for kids who have allergies, because some conservative right wing site ranted about how we were creating quote unquote snowflakes because of the teal pumpkin project. I don't know if you know. No. Yeah. What is that? If you put a teal pumpkin out on your porch, you're also indicating that you give out allergy free treats for Halloween, like, you know, toys or stickers or something so that kids with allergies know that whatever they can get is safe there. And it's kind of a topic close to my heart because my now 16 year old niece, while I was on the TV show and nobody bothered to tell me, by the way, ended up having such severe food allergies that she took a sample at Costco. Her heart stopped. She died. They had to restart her heart and she was in the hospital for a week. Oh my God. So, you know, you complaining about putting out a teal pumpkin that nobody's making you put out when it could actually save my niece's life. Go fuck yourself. You're the snowflake. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Like, please stop acting like a victim when nobody's forcing you to do this. It's just nice. It's being kind. Being kind isn't going to kill you, unlike my niece's allergies might kill her. So that was my other like food-based rant on there. And it's so funny because like I'm literally such a snowflake that they're tattooed on me. Like it's part of my tattoo sleeve. Oh, I love that. It takes a pride in it. So you can find that at kaihibbert.com. I'm also on social media on Facebook and then I have a Twitter and a lot of the stuff isn't safe for work, but it's genuine, it's authentic and it's me. I love it. Well, we'll put links to all of that in the show notes too, so people can find it. And Oh, I, I forgot. I also have a fictionalized reimagining of my experience on reality TV coming out as a book it just on Kindle, I believe sometime in the spring. So keep an eye out for that. That is so exciting. I'm very, yeah. very psyched about that. Is, is there a pre-order link available or? No, it's not even up for pre-order because I'm a coward and I keep going to publish and changing my mind. I didn't want to go with a traditional publisher because I went through such drama with other people owning my story. And so, and I had an amazing literary agent at one point who was incredibly patient and like, why do you keep waffling, you goober? <laughs> so uh, it should be, it should be ready for pre-order. I'm hoping by January because I would really like to counteract all the New Year's resolution diet bullshit out there with just a fun, sorted, this is why this whole experience was crazy, but completely fictionally reimagined beach read type thing for people to read. So I'm hoping around January. That sounds so fun. Well, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that then. And I'll link to your site in the meantime on the show notes. And I'm sure you'll be putting up info about it on your site. So if people follow you there, they'll, they'll be able to get it. Absolutely. I'm so excited that you had me. Thank you so much for letting me do this interview. This was fantastic. Oh, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Kai Hibbard for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you're looking for some practical tips to start putting intuitive eating and body acceptance into practice in your life, grab my free quick start guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. It's like a bonus podcast episode that I made to help you stop dieting and get free. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. 
If this podcast has helped you, then please help us spread the anti-diet message by sharing this episode on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Sharing on one of the Apple platforms helps bring us up higher in the podcast rankings so that more people discover us and so that we can continue to drown out the pro-diet messages that are at the top of the health category and keep rising up. So just click on the three dots at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen when you're listening in the Apple Podcasts platform, and then click the drop-down menu share episode at the bottom and you can share it that way. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, head over to christyharrison.com slash 133. That's christyharrison.com slash 133. This episode was brought to you by Jules Sous Vide by Chef Steps. Great cooking is part art, part science. Jules Sous Vide takes care of the science, cooking meat, fish, and poultry to perfection with precise temperature control. Jewel, perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash jewel and use the code foodpsych to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E, the French way, and then use the code foodpsych, F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H, at checkout. Food Psych is edited and engineered by Podcast Fast Track. Our administrative and community manager is Ashley Soroya, and our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. 